you go. God bless you. Let's show our appreciation for those that work with him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, if you have a Bible this morning, I'd invite you to turn with me to the book of Coloss- or Galatians, I should say, the other epis- epistle, Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, and we've been in a series on what we believe, and we have passed the halfway mark, and uh, we're going to talk this morning a little bit about sanctification. When's the last time you used the word sanctification in a conversation? (laughs) As Tom and I always talk about, there's these words out there, aren't there, that we don't tend to use it anymore, but yet they're vitally important to our spiritual health and development. And none is more true, maybe, than sanctification. Uh, Last week, if you were here, we talked about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. If you missed that message, you can go to our website and you can catch that online and uh, listen and watch there. But I, I think uh, sanctification is a great follow-up to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so this morning we're going to talk about that a little bit. And uh, let's pray before we do that again. Lord, we come before you this morning and we thank you because we know in you we live and we move and we have our being. And I pray, Lord, this morning that you would open up our hearts to receive what you have for us. Lord, we thank you that today you have given us all things for life and godliness in Christ Jesus. In other words, Lord, all that we have need of in our lives to become like Jesus is found in your word and in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And I pray this morning that you would help us to allow you to do your sanctifying work in us and through us. We thank you and we praise you and honor you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. We want to welcome you, those of you who just joined us for our live stream. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, As we shared with you last week, we are only live streaming the messages now because... Um, we bought a device that allows us to make the sound quality much, much better. And so we're just live streaming the sermon. So thanks uh, to those of you who have joined us. I don't know how many of you are big C.S. Lewis fans, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but there was another book called The Voyage of the Dawn Treader that C.S. Lewis wrote. And in the story... C.S. Lewis tells of how a young boy named Eustace became a dragon, a very unhappy dragon at that. How many of you have read the book? Did you have to read it? Yeah? You didn't have to, you just wanted to? (laughs) He's a very unhappy dragon, and he steals a gold armband and puts it on, only to find that his greed turns him into a dragon, and the armband is excruciatingly tight on his dragon foot. One night, in the midst of his pain and frustration, Eustace encounters a huge lion who tells the boy to follow it to a high mountain well. Eustace longs to bathe his aching foot in the cool water, but the lion tells him he must undress first. It seems silly to use this because dragons don't wear clothes. But then he remembers that dragons, like snakes, cast their skins. So Eustace scratches his skin and the scales begin falling off and soon his whole skin peels away. But when he puts his foot in the water, he sees that it is just as rough and scaly as before. He continues scratching at the second dragon skin and realizes there is yet another underneath. Finally, the lion says, you will have to let me undress you. 
Eustace is afraid of the lion's claws, but desperate to get in the water. The first tear is painfully deep as the lion begins to peel away the skin. Surely death will follow, Eustace believes. With the gnarled mess of dragon skin now cut away, the lion holds Eustace and throws him into the water. Initially, the water stings, but soon it is perfectly delicious. Eustace swims without pain, for he's a boy again. How many of you realize that when we pray, Lord, send the fire, the Holy Spirit fire, that we're inviting God to undress us, so to speak? And what he's undressing is our our flesh, amen? You know, I love the idea of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and I love the idea of God giving us gifts and giving us His uh, fruits. But how many of you know that when the fire comes, stuff scatters? Have you ever had a fire, and you light it, and all of a sudden it gets hot and something flies out? a bug or a little rodent or whatever the case may be in the country. What does, the fi- what does fire do? It refines. There's an old hymn that we used to sing. We don't sing it very much, but maybe we should bring it back. Called, Send the Fire. I'll read the words for you and give you something to consider. Thou Christ of burning, cleansing, flame, send the fire, send the fire, send the fire. Thy blood-bought gift today we claim. Send the fire, send the fire, send the fire. Look down and see this waiting host. Give us the promised Holy Ghost. We want another Pentecost. Send the fire, Send the fire, send the fire. God of Elijah, hear our cry. Send the fire, send the fire, send the fire. To make us fit to live or die. Send the fire, send the fire, send the fire. To burn up every trace of sin. To bring the light and glory in the revolution now begins send the fire send the fire send the fire it's at this point in william booth's hymn we begin to get a little bit less enthusiastic amen to burn up every trace of sin verse three tis fire we want for fire we plead send the fire send the fire send the fire the fire will meet Our every need. Send the fire, send the fire, send the fire. For strength to ever do the right. For grace to conquer in the fight. For power to walk the world in white. Send the fire, send the fire, send the fire. To make our weak Hearts strong and brave, send the fire, send the fire, send the fire. To live a dying world to save, send the fire, send the fire, send the fire. O see us on thy altar lay, our lives our all this very day. To crown the offspring now we pray, send the fire. Send the fire. Send the fire. When I was thinking about the message this week, I thought about to burn up every trace of sin. And I was suddenly reminded again how much sin dwells in Jamie. (laughs) Amen. Amen. You see, the reality is, is it's not so much what we may exhibit on Sunday morning with one another, although that's perfectly possible. It happens every week at churches. 
but it's a deep cleansing work that God is doing in us to conform us and to make us like Jesus. And it is not always fun. Is it always fun being married? Is it always fun having children? Is it always fun getting together with your in-laws for the holidays? The reality is that it's easy in some sense to come together on a Sunday morning and put our act together for an hour or so. But I'm here to tell you this morning, God is at work in your life to conform you to Jesus. And you can go kicking or in screaming, or you can surrender and allow Him to do it. But either way, if you've pledged your life to Him, if you said, I've given my life to Christ, for better or for worse, be prepared for Him to peel away additional layers you didn't know were there. That's what sanctification is is. Amen. God wants to separate us. Sanctification literally means to separate. God wants to separate us to himself and his perspective. Now, I don't know about you, but that to me is the hardest thing about the spiritual life. Watchman Nee wrote a great book, The Normal Christian Life, and there's nothing normal about it. You see, I'm a little bit hesitant when I pray, send the fire, send the fire, send the fire. Because I know God's looking at me and going, are you sure? According to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, sanctification is the work of God's free grace whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and to live unto righteousness. It is a continuing change worked by God in us, free from sinful habits and forming in us Christ-like affections, dispositions, and virtues. It does not mean that sin is instantly eradicated, but it is also more than counteraction, in which sin is merely restrained or repressed without being progressively destroyed. Sanctification is a real transformation, not just the appearance of one. Look in your Bibles at Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, verse 17. If, everybody say if, (laughs) if while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I am a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. Verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The essence of sanctification is the words of Paul in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. Is that your testimony this morning? I know I want it to be mine, but it's not. (laughs) 
It's not. The old Jamie loves to rear his ugly head. And yet, I know that Christ is at work in my life. Why? Because God wants to separate me to himself and to his purposes. R.C. Sproul said this, The basic meaning of sanctify is to set apart to God for his use, but God works in those whom he claims as his own to conform them to the image of his Son. You see, the reality is is that the holiness movement, there were some really good things about the holiness movement, but there were some flaws. And the holiness movement basically said this, separate yourself from the world, 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 separate yourself from the world. But that's not the end of what holiness means. True holiness is, is to separate yourself to God for His plan, for His purpose in your life. Now think about that. That has far-reaching ramifications, doesn't it? Amen. Are you here this morning? Because that means that every facet of my life, every facet of my being is sanctified to God. And I may, for instance, have a great job where I'm making the most money I've ever made. And God comes along and says to me, I want you to sell everything and go on the mission field. Why do I say that? Because I've met some guys this year in their 50s who God did just that. They were coming up on their retirement years. One of them will be here after the first of the year. And God said, I'm separating you now to my plan and my purpose. And I want you to go and serve other people groups in other nations to share the truth of who Jesus is. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Because how many of us would resist or just say, God, I, I want to give you 80%. Can I, I think I'm up to 80%, God. I'll, I'll give you 80. And maybe on Sundays, you know, I can bump it up to 90. But God, don't touch this, this 10%. It's mine. You know, that's one of the reasons I, I love the Lord of the Rings, because that ring, that powerful thing began, even though it was so small, think about it, it consumed Bilbo. You see, that's what unchecked sin in our lives does. Eventually, it consumes us from the inside out. You shouldn't be surprised at what's happening in Hollywood. You shouldn't be surprised what's happening in our culture. Sin satisfies for a season, but the Bible says eventually it comes to the light. The reality is for us, there's a few things we need to remember as we consider sanctification. Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. God is holy. What does that mean on a practical level, that God is holy? Well, God is not like us. That's a very practical definition of who God is. God is other. God is not like us. He doesn't think like us. He doesn't talk like us. He doesn't look like us as far as his perspective. He's different. And throughout Scripture, God declares that he is holy. Holy. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Psalms 96, verse 9. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. You see, we have this deception, if you will about our lives, and we think if we leave God alone, He'll leave us alone. 
No. We're made in his image. We're made in his likeness. And, and whether we believe it or not, we are made for him. Amen. Now, God in his mercy and God in his love gives us the choice and the option to choose not to worship him, to choose not to acknowledge him, but it doesn't change the fact that we are who we are. We're made in his image. We're made in his likeness. And we were made for him. I don't care how much you convince yourself otherwise. You'll never escape that reality. Sometimes I think about, why do people die? But you know what we never think about? Why do we get to live? God in his mercy, in a miraculous sort of way. I don't know if you know that, but the, the probability that you'd be here this morning, it's a fraction of like millionth percent that you would be here today, that you would be alive. And, and yet we never stop, do we, and ask, God, why did you give me life? But if we're going to ask, why does God allow death? We have to equally ask, why does God give us life? If God knew our propensity, and he did because he came up with a plan, if you were a him, you'd probably say, it's just not worth it. But that shows, doesn't it, God's rich and great mercy for us. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15 says this, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy places, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Even though God is other, even though God is holy, even though God is not like us, that wonderful promise that he comes to those who are of a humble and contrite spirit. Isaiah said it. David said it. Basically, they said, learn to get low before God because that's where he comes. Secondly, not only is God holy, but God calls us to holiness. God longs to make us holy, meaning set apart to him. God wants to set us apart for his purposes. Andrew Murray, the great author on prayer, said this, Let it be your business every day in the secrecy of the inner chamber to meet the holy God. You will be repaid for the trouble it may cost you. The reward will be sure and rich. I realize the longer that I serve in this capacity, the more I've undervalued and underappreciated how much God is at work, even when I don't see it and I don't feel it. The longer I live and the more I observe humanity, I realize God is at work. Now, he's not always doing what we want him to do or what's comfortable. That's part of the problem. We want God to work the way we want him to work. Right? And so when he doesn't, we go, wow, God's not at work. Oh, yes, he is. He, the Bible says he neither slumbers nor sleeps. You look at our culture today. People, oh, the world is spinning out of control. We've never been in a situation like this before. <laughs> really? Because my Bible says God puts leaders in place. And he takes him down. He exalts one nation and he turns another to ashes. And he does it on a Tuesday morning. 
First Peter chapter one, verses 14 through 16 says this as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. You see, one of the other drawbacks to the holiness movement is we believe that holiness had to do with something external over there. When in reality, Jesus said, the problem lies in here. Paul went so far as to say, look, I've come to the conclusion that in me dwells no good thing. I'm the problem. (laughs) That's what Paul said. And you see, if it's something external, if it's something out there, then, well, that particular external thing isn't a problem for me, therefore I must be holy, right? And God goes, oh, no, no. That's not what I'm looking at. I'm looking at it like Andrew Murray said, your inner chamber. Don't you love that? You know what that means? God's watching you on a Friday when you're cruising the internet and nobody's around. Your inner chamber. We get dressed up. We make ourselves look pretty for Sunday morning, you know, to impress God. And God's like, but I'm, I'm watching you 24-7. <laughs> and it's actually when we're alone with ourselves and God that we realize God is shouting to us what his plan and purpose is for us. Hebrews 12, 14 says this, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. God's more interested in your character than he is your career. Boy, that's a tough pill to swallow. (laughs) I love my career. God, it's going so good. God's interested in your character. God's interested in conforming you into Christ-likeness. God is holy. God calls us to holiness. And number three, my last point, is holiness, sanctification, is a team effort. When I was at the Brownsville Revival, I remember people would come forward with their addictions and their relational issues and their financial troubles and they would pray and God would meet them there. But how many of you know they'd turn around and they'd still have their relationship problem, they still have their financial problem, and for many of them, they still had their addiction problem. As much as we want to believe that God just zaps that out of us, it's just not the case. We've made decisions our entire lives that have brought us to this place and it's going to take some time for God to peel back, amen, the ignorance that Paul spoke of and to conform us into Christ's likeness. So here's the point. The point is, is that it happens not just on God's part and not just on our part, but when we team up with what God is doing in our lives and we say, okay, God, I give up. I'm going to try your way, right? Right? Holiness is a team effort between us and the Holy Spirit. We can't make ourselves holy, but we can't just sit back and God ask God to zap us into Christ-likeness. This is why, and I want to say this because this is very important, you and I need Christian fellowship. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Whenever I get annoyed, and it's all the time, I think about this message. And I think about, God, what is it that annoys me about this? There's no rhyme or reason to it, really. And God goes, oh, yes, there is rhyme and reason. You want to be in control. You want to be God, little g. No, not me, right? I read a phenomenal quote this week that 
just this is a off the sidetrack, but powerful quote. The devil has no stories. Like I'm thinking about that, I go, that's pretty interesting. The devil has no stories. All the devil has is what he did and what he invites you to do with him, which is to reject the sovereignty of who God is. Amen. And so what ultimately happens in our lives when we get to a place of frustration with our lives is we're mad we're not God. Because I wouldn't do it this way, God. We get frustrated with our family, our, our relationships. We say, God, ugh. Right? And what God is saying is, can you trust me? I don't know about you, but I can't keep doing this. Getting frustrated and having things not go my way. It's exhausting. So I have to trust that God is at work even when I don't see it or feel it. R.C. Sproul also said this, God's method of sanctification is neither activism, self-reliant activity, nor apathy, God-reliant passivity, but human effort dependent on God. When I had some sort of vice in my life, let's put it that way, whatever it is, and I say, I'm going to kill this vice. If I don't ask God to help me, it ain't going to die. <laughs> right? But equally, if I just sit around and say, well, God, you're, you're not taking this vice away from me, so I guess it's... No. It's a team effort. Sanctification, holiness is a team effort. God uses the circumstances in your life. He uses the people in your life. He uses his word. He uses his Holy Spirit. But ultimately, God sees you with the end in mind. A project that he knows how he wants it to look when it's all said and done. And he's going to form you and mold you and strip away those layers to make you like Jesus. Unfortunately. <laughs> you see, we believe in this work. We believe that God wants to sanctify us. We believe that God wants to make us like him, make us holy, set us apart for his purposes. How many of you remember that great song, Tears in Your Eyes? Refiner's Fire. Refiner's Fire. I love this song. My heart's one desire is to be holy. It's easy to sing it, right? Especially if you've got a good worship team. The lighting is just right. The people are swaying in sync with you at camp, wherever. And you leave, and you go out to lunch, and they mess up your lunch. What in the world? I said no cheese on my burger or whatever. No offense, honey. What happens there? Right? Because what we've done is we've believed that God is actually capable of being compartmentalized. So he's just there on Sunday in the box. And when we leave, we put him back in the box. We'll see you next week. Don't come out, right? God doesn't like boxes. He comes with us. Which makes me very scared to leave my house. And for some of you, it makes you very nervous about going through roundabouts. Because you're afraid random fingers will start doing things that God doesn't intend them to do. When you do that, think about this message. God wants to make you like Jesus 
Here's the reason that this matters as I close for us as a church. We want to be moving in sync together with what God's doing in us individually. Amen? And my job as your pastor is to encourage you and to remind you that God's trying to kill you. Your old you. And he's trying to make you like Jesus. And if he's not able to do that, you're going to mess it up for the rest of us. I'm going to mess it up for the rest of us. Right? So God, make us holy. Let us know that the pain that we're temporarily experiencing will lead to something good. By the way, bad news, Jordan, you're supposed to do a follow-up shot on your was it hepatitis? Bad news, buddy. Got to go to the doctor and get a shot. But how many of you know it's good, right? I hate shots. Honey, do you like shots? <laughs> but it's for our good. In many ways, that's what sanctification is. It's painful, but it's for our benefit. It keeps us healthy. It keeps us strong keeps us like Jesus. Lord, I pray that in my frailty and in my weakness this morning, the message that you wanted to come through today did. And I know, Lord, today that there are things that you've spoken to other people's lives today not connected to what I've said. But what I'm praying this morning, Lord, for all of us, for those watching online today, is that we would understand that you are the potter and we are the clay. And that when the fire of the Holy Spirit comes and shows us things in our lives that he's trying to refine in us, we would be excited about it, knowing that it's another layer of our old selves that's being stripped away so that the newness of the life of Christ in us shines more brighter. Lord, help us, especially as we age and we hate change, to move with the rhythms of your grace in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you are good and that you have good things for us. So much better than anything that this world has to offer. And let us accept that reality. We thank you this morning. We praise you for what you're going to do in us and through us. And we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.